So, let us take a look at uh, Mikhail Tal. All right, so in this game, Mikhail Tal, let me just check again, uh, was playing uh, Hodgson. This is 1987. All right, let us see how Mikhail Tal dealt with the center. So again, um, they opened up with the Rui Lopez. Okay, Mikhail Tal is playing the white side. Okay, all this is like standard, so we're not going to waste too much time on these moves. All right, so let's take a breather here. Again, we have reached uh, a closed position. And now let us see if Mikhail Tal will be focusing on the flanks. All right, so in this position, he played bishop. Okay, this is all book. And uh, he went b4. So you can see already he's focusing on the flanks. Okay, in this regard, he's focusing on the queen side. So he plays b4. On the first glance, this seems like it's a free pawn. Uh, but actually, it is not. It's a poisonous pawn. If black tries to win it by playing knight, uh, takes b4, I think black will lose the knight. All right, so the bishop is now attacking the knight, and the knight does not have uh, good squares to run to. The only other way that black would actually try to protect the pawn is by moving the queen to c5 but even then why to simply play queen to b3 and the knight is lost so that was a um, poison uh, pawn he could not uh, capture it with the knight so after b4 um, black played pawn to g6 um, I have no idea why he really played pawn to g6. Uh, maybe it's because uh, uh, he wanted to prevent uh, white from moving the knight to f5. It's possible that he was trying to prevent that. Or maybe he had ideas of moving um, his knight away and then launching uh, maybe a kingside attack, a kingside pawn storm by playing f5. Um, I'm not sure. You know, because in this position, again, white is slightly better. So I'm just assuming that black's um, best chances here was to at least first try to, uh, to, to make his position better and then maybe possibly attack. So after g6, white played a bishop to d2. Captures, captures. And now white has managed to open up his rook on the flanks so it's directly attacking the knight okay so what does uh, black play he goes queen b7 supporting the knight bishop d3 putting more pressure on the flanks on the queen side knight c7 and uh i, I kind of like uh, white's position here okay let us just assess this position for a while Look at Black's knight. It doesn't have good squares to move to. All right, it's a bit passive. If it chooses to move to e8, it'll pretty much get stuck. All right, even after e8, if it tries to move to g7, h5, but so what? It's not really doing much uh, on c7. All right, so I kind of like uh, White's uh, position here. So let us proceed. Why played knight to c2? All right, so let us just quickly uh, uh, count the number of pieces that white has on the queen side and uh, the number of pieces that black is having. White has one, two, three, four, five pieces on the queen side against one, two, three, four. This is what I would like to call are the excellent way of dealing with the close center. Because white has more pieces on the queen side, that's why he's carrying out an attack on the queen side. Unlike the previous game, okay, nothing against uh, Matanovic, but in the previous game, Matanovic actually had 
a few more pieces on the queen side, even though he chose to go that way. All right. Fortunate enough for him, he was able uh, to succeed and he won the game. But I think this would be the more excellent way of doing it. More pieces, then you attack. All right. Let us continue. So black plays knight h5. Again, I'm not sure what he wants to play. We also saw this move in the previous game. So I'm sure he wants to go to f4. All right. But then what, what then after knight f4? This position seems to be very difficult for black. All right. So white plays bishop to e3. Now, mind you, this bishop is now on the king's side, but still has influence on the flanks. You see, because together they are connecting here. All right, so the bishop still has influence on the queen side, on the flanks. So it still counts as a piece attacking the flanks. All right, so white played a, rook eight, a black played rook a8, queen. All right, so... Uh, one other way of dealing, or the best way of dealing with weak squares is by occupying them using big pieces. Weak squares, you occupy them with big pieces and not pawns. All right, so as you can see, black is already having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven weak squares. All right, and one of the weak squares is already occupied by the bishop. And I think now white is aiming to go to a5 and c6, which both these squares are weak squares. Let us proceed. Knight a5, white brings another piece to the queen side, because that's where he's having uh, the advantage. Rook a8, all right, black brings uh, another piece to his defense. Queen c2, threatening the knight on c7. The knight moves to e8. We have queen b3. Okay, and the knight is on c6. Um, I read somewhere, I don't know if it was Kasparov or somebody else who spoke about, uh, he said a knight on e6, c6, d6, and f6, if it's well supported, it is as good as a rook. That's how powerful it becomes. It becomes so powerful that it is as strong as a rook. And I would like to think um, that this one is, is as powerful as a rook because it's not easy um, to uh, remove it from where it is now. All right, so knight c6. I'm sorry, he played a queen b2. Exchange. Look at that move. Just go back. Tau plays rook to c5. Don't you just love this move? Rook to c5, threatening the pawn on b5. That's an amazing move. I wonder when he passed away, I think in one of these books, they wrote the death of a magician. Because to me, this is like magic. Imagine just playing rook to c5. Amazing. All right, so we are not going to get into uh, too much details here because in this lesson, it's not mainly about the calculation, but we are just focusing mainly on the principles of the center. All right, so we're trying to check where uh, Tao is uh, focusing mostly on. All right, so after rook to c5, I would like to think that if black had captured knight takes e5, is just too powerful. All right, I don't know if it's winning for sure, but this is just very powerful because now uh, white is threatening to discover the king had to check and this knight will be attacking the queen. All right, I don't know how black intends to defend this position, but it's not uh, that easy. So let us go ahead and see uh, what uh, black played in this position. So after rook c5, Black continued, queen a6, 
White simply captured the pawn. Knight c7, attacking the rook, rook to b8. Now, as you can see, this is a discovered attack. The bishop is attacking the queen. All right, so what does uh, black play? He captures. There goes another move. Tal is an amazing player. He goes knight takes e5. Again, to me, I'm not sure after pawn takes e5, I would like to think that Tal was going to play queen. Um, I'd like to think he was going to play queen e5 and then captures uh, on a c7. But again, black is still having two pieces here. All right, two pieces, but maybe for three pawns. I don't know who was going to be better. I don't know which position, whom you prefer here. All right, but uh, let's get back to the game and let's see what happened. So after knight takes e5. Okay, black played queen d1. Check. King h2. Rook a1, threatening a checkmate in one move. And there is no decent defense to that, which means in this position, Tao must make sure uh, that a checkmate is opened. Otherwise, his position is lost. All right, so what does white play? Tao goes knight g4 check, leaving black with not many options here. Black has got two options, to block with the knights or to move the king. All right. Of which blocking with the knight is good is not good because after after queen captures the knight, it's a checkmate. All right, so which means forced knight check. Only one option is to play king e7, and that's what black did. Knight check again; it's forced. Black is only left with king to f7 which will be met by knight g5 checkmate. So in this position, um, black resigned. What a game. What a game. So let's quickly recap on it again. Let's go uh, to when the position turns into a close center. And let's see how Tao carried out everything. So look at this. a3. Already Tao is focusing on the queen side, on the flanks. Captures, captures, still his focus is on the queen side. More pressure that side. Pressure on the flanks. Exchange, exchange, we still on the flanks, on the left flanks. All right, left flanks. Okay, knight c6, we're still on the queen's side. We are attacking from the sides because we can't come in the middle because the center is closed. Exchange, exchange. We're still on the queen's side. And now we are on the brink of an explosion. We are trying to open up the position of the center by playing rook c5. Black does not accept, rook takes. Then we break. Um, the center. It's now open. Check, 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 and um, black resigns. Guys, I hope you're getting it. The first game with Matanovic, he also attacked very well on the queen's side, uh, but like I said, he went for the side where he had fewer pieces. All right, but he managed uh, to win the game. Now, in this game, Tao went for the queen side because that's where he had more big pieces. I think that is the excellent way of dealing with closed um, uh, centers. So in the next um, game, we are going to look at uh, the first game. It was Matanovic winning against uh, Milic. And the second game, it was Tao winning. And so in the, in the next uh, segment, we are going to look at Tao versus uh, Milanovic. Okay, and we are going to see who understands who's going to deal with these centers in the most effective way. All right, thank you guys. I'll be back uh, shortly.